Thank you very much, and thank you to everyone who's watching in uh, London, in Dhaka, and in uh, Bogota. And I, good, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is for you. Um, the report that was uh, prepared by the high-level panel is really a report that represents the views of many, many people. Uh, we had more than uh, 5,000 uh, organizations in more than 120 countries. We received nearly 900 uh, written submissions, uh, not counting uh, the input that went in in the online uh, consul consultation. So there's been a lot that has come through. So we think it is reflective of uh, the views of many constituencies. Of course, not every constituency finds the, their views or their proposals in exactly uh, their language. Everything has had to be consolidated and shrunk uh, and shrunk together. But I think that many people will find the expression of their own uh, views and, uh, and, and aspirations in, uh, in, in, in the panel's work. So that is something that is quite, uh, quite exciting. Let me highlight what, in my view, are uh, the major, some of the major features of, of, of the report. I think David might want to a little bit more details and, uh, and, 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 and specifics. But I think the panel was very cognizant of the fact that the year 2013 uh, is very different from the year 2000 when the Millennium Declaration uh, was issued and when the Millennium when the MDGs were actually. Uh, so there was a lot of effort to uh, take cognizance of friends, uh, find what is missing in the MDGs and include, but also find what is changing in the new, in the new context. So we find that there is an expanded, expanded agenda. But the panel also found that there is a lot of ownership and recognition for the MDG, therefore it's not possible split away uh, the MDGs and, uh, and, and start on a different alternative path. So we've ourselves building a lot on, NGO, on, 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 on the MDGs, addressing things, but also keeping, uh, focusing as well on some stuff that is not yet uh, completed. I think that uh, the report uh, and, and the agenda proposed by the panel is, is quite important. I, or certainly hope the sector did not weak it. And it's been, it's, it's, it's been you know, in, in various countries uh, so far. Let me highlight what I think the four major features of the agenda that is proposed by the panel. It's one, a truly universal development agenda, one that recognizes the common nature of all challenges that all countries are confronted with. So it's not focused alone or imagine market or imagine economy so the bigger thing is still a universal agenda for all. It's also an inclusive development agenda as it aims to provide space for relevant engagement of uh, stakeholders. Uh, a third feature in my view is that the fact that it's an integrated development agenda it poses to harmonize and clearly integrate the three pillars sustainable uh, a development. In our view, it's quite a transformative development agenda that goes beyond the symptoms and aims to address the fundamental uh, causes of poverty and, uh, and, and unsustainability. In that respect, the panel has proposed five transformative shifts, which are profound structural changes that will overcome obstacles to uh, sustained uh, prosperity. The five are quite clear and, 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 and are in the report. And uh, the first one, and, and this is mostly an, an agenda to completion of the MDGs, but look to that at all the different uh, constituencies. It's an agenda to one, and a radical commitment to equality and uh, discrimination. It puts quality of opportunity at the heart of the 2015, setting that all should be disaggregated and tracked with respect to income, especially for the bottom 20%. Gender, location, age, people living with disabilities that are relevant uh, social groups. So that when we take stock, panel recommends that the target will only be considered achieved if they are 
add to all relevant income and social groups. It puts sustainable development at the core. We must make a rapid shift to sustainable patterns of production, and we act now to slow the alarming of climate change and environmental. Thirdly, we talk about transformation of economies to jobs and inclusive growth, which was a missing component of the MDGs. And fourth one, building peace and effective, open and accountable institutions for all. Freedom from violence, conflict and oppression is essential to human existence and the foundation for building peaceful and prosperous uh, societies. We're calling for a fundamental shift to recognize peace and good governance as a core element of well-being, not just an optional extra. And finally, we call for a forging a new global partnership, a new effort of international and global solidarity, cooperation, and mutual accountability as underpin the post-2015 agenda. This new partnership should be built on our shared humanity and based on mutual respect and mutual benefit. So those are some of the main ideas and highlights of the report. David may will probably go into a little bit more detail into the illustrative goals which the panel recommends to operationalize the vision that, uh, that has been captured in the narrative. The illustrative goals are not compulsory, they're just illustrative for that for that purpose and they're not necessarily exhaustive but in our view they represented uh, the best represent the, the, the best presentation of how we could actualize the vision uh, in the narrative thank you very much claire thank you very much indeed betty i apologize for the poor sound at the beginning of what you were saying but i think we uh, we all understood your meaning and it got very clear towards the end um, if any of that was unclear then please do pick that up with betty in the questions but turn it over to david then Thanks, Claire, and, and uh, thank you, Betty. That's a great overview of the panel report. Before, um, before I really speak, can I just do a quick survey in the room? How many of you are familiar with the Millennium Development Goals? And by familiar, I think name up to six. <laughs> no, name at least six, <laughs> name at least six. OK, so that's probably 98% of people in the room. How many of you are familiar with the Millennium Declaration? And by familiar, I mean can probably quote excerpts from it. I don't see any hands going up elsewhere. OK, <laughs> so we've got about probably, let's say, 4% of the room there. I'll come back to why I think that's important in a minute. So uh, I think what I'm going to say is going to repeat a little bit what uh, Betty did. I apologize for that. But uh, I'm going to talk about what I think is exciting about the high-level panel report. Um, and I've got six things that I think are exciting. First of all is the proposal that we're going to end extreme poverty in all its forms forever. Now, some people have come back and said, well, you know, this kind of $1.25 a day poverty, what's that? You know, that's, that's, that's nothing. Well, <coughs> most economists disagree. Most economists think that ending, as in getting everybody above that basic poverty line, is an incredibly hard stretch. Most economists tell me that it's impossible. So there's a huge challenge there to achieve that goal. And the panel's proposing that there should be similar kind of social, minimum social flaws. Um, or zero goals is uh, in the jargon in, in other areas as well. So I think that's really exciting, really challenging. Secondly, and Betty mentioned this, is a proposal to track outcomes for every quintile, including the lowest quintile, um, for every um, important social group, um, for by gender, by geography, for by ability or disability, and to say that no target should be considered met unless it's been met by all those groups. I think that that is probably the most powerful thing that the panel has said. I think it hasn't really been picked up uh, a lot yet, but I think that if we can lodge that in the UN, that will be the most important thing we can do on equality over the next 20 years. Personal view. Thirdly, there's a really clear message on integrating uh, sustainable development and poverty agendas. Um, and demonstrating, because this is one of the big exam questions that's out there, you know, demonstrating how you could do that through an illustrative goal framework. Fourthly, a really strong message on economic transformation and growth. 
And this was being put forward very strongly uh, from the African Union in the contacts that we had from them and from many members of the panel that the MDGs weren't strong enough on these issues, that they were really important for Africa and for other poor countries. And, and, and also a strong push that actually, yes, we do want to end extreme poverty, but people have higher aspirations than that. And to get that, we need jobs, uh, we need growth, and we need to transform our economies. Fifthly, and this is where I'm coming back to my initial question, the Millennium Declaration had a lot to say on human rights, on governance, on peace, um, all the issues that, that, that some people describe as enablers. Personally, I think that they're important intrinsic issues as well. But none of those went into the Millennium, Devel Millennium Go um, Development Goals. And as we um, demonstrate in our little survey in this room, that means that what got attention was the issues in the goals, not what was in the, in the framework, uh, sorry, in the, in the declaration. So what the panel has done is said, well, we think those issues are intrinsically important in themselves, as well as being fundamental enablers, and they need to have a place in the next set of goals. And I think that's a really powerful and important message, highly controversial, will take some uh, some doing to lodge that in the UN, but if it can be done, I think that will be um, tremendously important for development, um, not just for, uh, for politics. Um, and then lastly, and Betty again touched on this, is um, an end to the concept that was perhaps unintentionally uh, embedded in the MDGs, which, was, which it was all about aid, it was all about rich countries and poor countries, and a kind of very traditional relationship between countries if you like, in the rich north and the poor south. Um, the panel said that's, aid's important, but it's only a start, and the world has changed fundamentally uh, now. It, it's not just about state-to-state -state relations for a start, it's about the role of CSOs, it's about the role of business, it's about the role of citizens, and it's about accountabilities for all of those in pursuing uh, the achievement of a new set of goals. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed. Right. That is the, the, quick, the quickest summary, I think, of the <laughs> high-level panel report that you're probably ever going to get. So <laughs> thank you very much indeed to both of you. Let me turn now to um, some of our respondents to offer their perhaps highlights from the report and responses to it. Um, let's go first to... Uh, God, I feel like some sort of Eurovision Song Contest host here. <laughs> Calling... <laughs> Let's go first to Dhaka and, um, and to the panel there. Deb, are you ready? Yes, clear. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, excellent. Uh, good evening from Dhaka. I'm at the Center for Policy Dialogue office at this moment. And I have with me uh, colleagues here. On my left uh, is Ms. Farah Kabir. She is the country director of ActionAid in Bangladesh. I have next to he he her, uh, Professor Mustafizur Rahman, who is the Executive Director of Center for Policy Dialogue. And on my right here is Mahinao. She is with the Southern Voice Secretariat in CPD. So I would like to join everybody else in uh, greeting uh, people in London, in uh, Nairobi, and in, uh, in Bogota. Since time is short, please consider all the compliments have been said, uh, what is necessary. Uh, so I'll be concentrating more on the some of the uh, uh, questions or worries which are there. And uh, please uh, take our best compliments on for doing a, such a heroic job in putting together all those diverse thoughts in, in, in s such a limited number of pages. Uh, I would like to compliment the high-level panel for the, mm, uh, the, the mention, uh, the, the way they have put together five transformative shifts, how they have defined the seven cross-cutting issues, the 12 goals, the illustrative goals, and 54 indicators. Yeah, it's, uh, it's quite good in many ways. Let me put my worries to you. The first issue which has always bothered the think tanks in, this, uh, in the global south is how an universal agenda is going to address the specific needs of the disadvantaged countries in the world. So the, to what extent the concerns of the vulnerable and fragile states have been and, uh, included uh, in the go illustrative goals and also in other areas. Uh, it concerns the LDCs, the small island development states, the climate change affected country, the landlocked countries, 
the conflict countries and the post-conflict countries, how this universal agenda did justice to these specific concerns. This come up more concretely because if you look at the uh, cross-cutting issues which have been uh, identified, uh, where we see that there are uh, issues related to uh, inequality and there are issues specific to cities, young people and girls and women. But we d we d why there couldn't be an, a cross-cutting issue which relates to the vulnerable disadvantaged countries in particular? Let me move on to the next worry, is that how does one a sustainable development goal, SD SDGs for that matter, really does justice in balancing the con economic, social, and the environmental concerns? Because we know very well they have different implications for different countries, depending upon their develop level of development and geographical location. And whether we so sh demonstrate enough sensitivities to that, and, and, and we know very well the, the roles played by different countries are quite different in this particular way. Uh, that it would be definitely the, the, the second uh, transformative shift, what we are talking about, the putting sustainable development at the core. Now, coming to the transformation, the other shift on the transformation of economies, jobs, and inclusive growth, uh, the, the issue is that how do you really enable it? Because, and do, what do we really put in as an indicator uh, the, beyond the decent work, share, and other issues as has been dead? Uh, put there, uh, because the productive capacity building concerns which has been put in, it has come up much more than in the MDG. But is it really, uh, uh, has it been really adequately addressed? We, we do have our own uh, specific suggestions on that, but, uh, but let us put it as it is at this moment. Similarly, if you look at the, uh, since I don't have time to go through the more detailed comments, which will be provided possibly in a written form letter, Look at the issue of the forging a new global partnership. This had been the bone of contention in the last MDG. The MDG 8 was the weakest link, as we have always defined. Uh, many, uh, the, the trade, migration, and ODA issues have been raised there. But you see, the very important element of this new global order would have been intellectual property right, access to technology. We do not see very good mention of that particular area over there. If you move on a bit more, uh, and then we will see that targets will be considered achieved if it is achieved in all groups and sections. And I agree that, that this is a very powerful message. But it still concerns intra-country issues. What about the in inter-country inequality issue, which also relates leaving no one, no, no one behind? So the, the whole emphasis of the report is more within the country boundaries, although sustainable development talks about planetary boundaries. So we do not see any mention about inter-country inter inequalities and their access to resources as they go. Uh, to, uh, to, to conclude for this, uh, for this moment um, is the issue of accountability on the delivery. And if you look at it, uh, the, the, on the accountability form part, uh, there are mention in certain paragraphs that it is accountability of all the partners but we do not see how the global institutions have been made accountable on this particular issue. Although there has been mentioned only the old uh, rhetorical way of the routine things of reporting and other things other than a peer monitoring which has been added. Uh, we thought they could have also be creative and alluded to a possibility of an independent monitoring mechanism which would have brought in more transparency uh, than other than these intergovernmental obscure processes which really did not allow many people to have access to these discussions. Uh, I will, for the time being, will stop here and conclude on a very highly positive note by saying uh, we strongly support the data revolution concept. Because as research institutions, we are generators and great users of these data. Data for us is an instrument, not only as an information, but also for ensuring accountability and transparency. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much. I'm sure there are many people in this room who would second that. Um, and we hope to hear from some of your colleagues in a moment when we turn to the Q&A session. But for now, let me um, ask Philip in Bogota, please, um, if you'd like to come in with your response to the report and what you've heard so far. 
Yes, good morning, Claire, uh, and to your colleagues in London and also Nairobi and Dakar. We're here in Bogota, Colombia, with representatives of the Colombian civil society, the Colombian government, and the international community as well. And our reactions uh, to the report, it's that it is a very realistic process about the de development changes and challenges uh, for the future. A universal agenda and common goals, it's an ambitious agenda, which we are seeing with profound changes by outlining the, tri the five transformational shifts applicable to all development actors, uh, be it low-income countries or high-income uh, countries. And it reflects the universality of actors which have been involved in this consultation process, finding a clear balance and a representation of many views. And it has been a respectful uh, way of showing the priorities uh, of the work of many development actors. We applaud especially from a region like Latin America and the Caribbean, that the HLP report uh, is calling for peace and personal security as a foundation for development. And as well, the vision of eradicating poverty in all its forms. But we also have some concerns about the report, and we see that inequality, it remains, and opportunity is not open to all. General criticism has been actually made from our region to that very specific point, and that we need to track uh, the, pro the process of development at all levels of income. It is important, therefore, uh, that we have specific targets and goals for inequality, and it should be smart, as they already mentioned in the report, that they be specific, measurable, attainable, and also relevant and time-bound. And about these targets, without the targets, uh, efforts to reduce inequality, social and economic progress will be undermined, in our view. So the, progress, uh, the process targets of high-level income countries and goals focused on excluded groups, uh, we welcome it very much uh, indeed. Data and transparency revolution. Our colleagues were just mentioned the importance uh, of data. And we see there's awareness of the gap between the reality on the ground and the statistical targets that we are actually tracking. And therefore, the inclusion of transparency and also accountability, it's something that will trigger this process and information as priorities in the HLP report will empower actually uh, at every level the development actors. So this is a very, very important point for middle income countries. As you know, Latin America and the Caribbean, we're the middle class of the world. Out of the 33 countries in our region, 31 uh, are middle income countries uh, or high middle income countries. So this is a point that will be uh, of not only concern, but a very great challenge because we need to build better capacity to have better data. Uh, and the annual report will need a lot of data that has to be created by all development actors. The panel also believes uh, that most of the money will come from domestic resources. And we believe that there we need a results oriented budget and stronger institutions especially in Latin America. But we also see some concern that uh, there's still a target uh, on the order and uh, um, commitment for a 0.7%. And it is not a good way in our point of view to measure finance for development because it does not include all financial flows. Uh, and we need a different way to measure uh, development finance. And for therefore, we actually make a call for the G77 that should review all uh, this in the near future. About the global partnership, our views is that a new global partnership should engage all development actors as the report states it as well. And accountability, therefore, uh, on a results-based agenda uh, and with clear evidence. That's something that we see that everyone uh, involved should be accountable. And that includes, of course, civil society, especially the private sector and governments itself and international institutions. Um, we also see that the report shows a certain distance between the national consultation processes and what actually came out of the report. Uh, and some points that we have seen, and we have seen many colleagues in Latin America to raise about it, it's not only inequality, but it is the role of middle-income countries. Uh, and we would have liked a stronger approach uh, towards middle-income countries from the report. And for the future perspectives, and to finish up uh, this first round of comments, we find it that our work 
will now start actually. It is hard work that we will happen in front of now. We need to translate all this agenda into practical steps that governments around the world can implement regardless of economic strength. And also we need to generate and transfer knowledge through South-South cooperation mechanisms. In our belief, civil society must continue to be an important voice uh, in, in these conversations and the consultation, and we believe also the dissemination of the report could be entry points of CSOs on a regional and a global uh, level. And at last, we hope that we'll, this will be uh, a reference point for forthcoming negotiation of development frameworks uh, and also make a stronger point about the benefits of actually investing in sustainable development, that they are high, they are a good investment, and that we cannot say grow now, clean later. That's clearly not the answer. So this is all for now, Claire from Borota. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Fascinating overlap and also difference in perspectives there, I felt, between those two responses. Um, and to finish off this section, let me now go back to Nairobi and invite Namla Maniki Mangaliso to um, give us your views on this discussion and on the report itself. Thank you, Chair, for that. Um, let me just mention that I speak on behalf of a group that has been meeting the whole day here in Nairobi, uh, representing uh, perspectives from the region um, on the HLP report. I think without a doubt, um, the very first thing worth saying is um, an overwhelming support and appreciation of the hard work that has gone into compiling this report. And we've said earlier on that we congratulate members of the HLP heartily for the hard work that they put in. Quite clearly, this report does up the bar or lift the bar from what we have been used to in terms of global development compacts. It does um, a, 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 a continue on this track of a transformative agenda and a number of things can be mentioned in relation to that including the zero percent goals that we see there including the terminology around equality of opportunity center staging the aspirations and the needs of the poor and the vulnerable groups in a new development compact and so in the in the spirit of the other speakers that have spoken before i think Essentially, it's an appreciation for the hard work and the output that we see um, in the report. We do appreciate also that the report very successfully presents a compelling vision. So both in terms of the theory of change as well as in terms of the five um, transformative shifts, we also appreciate the fact that the report actually brings together the, the, the poverty track, um, the economic development track, as well as the sustainability one and that helps us to pave a new way of thinking um, as the global community so the conclusion um, i think by consensus of the meeting was that while the report doesn't include everything as it could not possibly do it does give us a language and creates a platform and another arrow in our arsenal as it were in terms of promoting a development agenda that will help us to eradicate poverty and see sustainability um, in the future. Um, a couple of critical questions came up as we were discussing. One of them is not in relation to the, to the report, but in relation to our concerns as global citizens. And it was the question around, we are driving a transformative agenda. Do we have global transformative leadership to ensure that this agenda is implemented. And that leadership is across the board from governments that need to be accountable for this, from the private sector, academic, civil society, and so where collective ownership and leadership um, is required that is going to be equally ambitious, equally committed, um, and equally transformative as it were. Political will is at the root of that. The second one, rela relating uh, very directly to the report, is that while the report very bravely uh, promotes um, what it's calling a transformative socioeconomic agenda, how, what we felt was that it does fall flat in terms of articulating what that means. 
Um, and given the fact that the report seems to have a reliance on the current um, economic market system that already exists, which has reproduced inequality, which has reproduced some of the global problems we see, such as the plundering of world resources, such as the scramble for Africa's natural resources as we speak, illicit financial flows and irregular, um, um, uh, the, the, the hyper-financialized um, economic uh, global system that we see, um, all of which uh, perpetuates the inequalities and therefore perpetuates and instigates um, conflicts, and that is an issue that needs um, a careful attention, as it were. The reliance on the creation of employment, and we do, um, we did get from the HLP representatives that were in our meeting that when they talk about the creation of jobs, they are talking about all gainful em employment, including um, the, the informal sector. But we know that the jobs that are being created by our, our markets currently are focusing on the IT sector, the services sector, and the financial sector. In the African continent in particular, these sectors have not been able to integrate um, uh, uh, populations and ordinary citizens into the economy. So we need to really drill down to what, what would we mean when we're talking about a transformative uh, economic agenda. We as civil society here want to further commit to aspects of the report that are starting to articulate this. So the report, for instance, talks about better access to infrastructure for the poor. It talks about better access to financing. It particularly talks about better access to the ownership of productive assets for women, for youth, and for excluded groups. And we think that this is something that we are going to continue um, to champion, as it were. Um, we felt that given the difficulties in the, the, the global um, development and global economic systems, one of the things that would help us move forward is what we're calling an ethical framework that would actually guide global actors, but also that would provide control over what it is that the global actors are doing. This links very much to accountability. I think a number of people in the room were saying, how do we hold people accountable? How do we make sure that there's a place and there's a consequence when global actors fail to act in the way that is being prom promoted in this report and in other um, global compacts that already exist. And so we are saying we support the idea of a centralized system um, of accountability, but also we recognize the role of other players, particularly citizens at the national level, to promote um, accountability. We did say that as we were talking about employment, one of the things, particularly in looking at the de gender dimensions, one of the things we need to be careful about is the de gender di division of labor and ensuring that the, 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 the mainstreaming of gender issues is across the board. That is not without recognizing that there's special attention paid in this report on gender issues, particularly eliminating violence against women and children um, and, and ensuring that uh, 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 women are supported as active um, economic actors. Um, we, um, we also acknowledged the, the fact that the report advances some of the things that were in the MDGs, but particularly looking at outputs and quality. But we did mention that we want to make sure that we don't forget about the access issues. I think a particular point was made on the, the attention to health and particularly the availability as well as the accessibility of health systems as we care also about the quality issues as it were. A number of emphasis points that are mentioned in the report but that we want to continue to promote. Accountability and the centrality of citizens, um, which I've mentioned already. Uh, uh, supporting the new emerging ideas around new global partnerships where there's equal respect and equal responsibility of all players for this new agenda. And then uh, an important area around implementation. So ensuring that essentially this agenda is, um, is implemented and domesticated. As I'm wrapping up, last 30 seconds, is that we spend quite a bit of time talking about next steps, what needs to be done. And the first thing is that we're saying we want to build on what's here in this report. And we want to make sure that as we enter into a very difficult political system 
of making sure that member states in the United Nations adopt some of the progress areas that have been adopted here. We want to work harder in, in making sure that the global CSO community is promoting some of these things. We also said for us in the African continent, it's really going to be important to make sure that there's alignment with some of the AU-led processes, particularly the Africa Common Visions, um, 63 plan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all in all, um, a very positive leap forward, um, and we need to to strengthen those areas that are gains in the report. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, this is great. It's all so holding up well so far. Very exciting. Fingers crossed. Um, let me, before we turn back to um, the different audiences to give you a chance to ask your questions, let me ask Amina, um, who obviously as a member of the high level panel and as the um, Secretary General's representative on post 2015 has both been involved in this process and will be absolutely key in the process to come. So you can be the bridge for us between the, the panel and the, the process which follows. But please, over to you. 